Sure. Welcome back to another Whiskey Wednesday with Vinny's Beverage Depot. I'm Pat, as usual, along with Joe and Brett from the Whiskey Hotline. Uh, our special guest this week, Mr. Wes Henderson, founder of Angels Envy, bourbon, rye, and other now, I suppose. So, Wes, nice to see you again. He's uh, been a guest on our podcast before. You may have seen him or met him at a few of our stores, comes into town when available, and does some events. Hopefully, we can get back to that at some point here. So, Wes, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Miss you guys. Miss, miss being out. Um, I'm ready to... I'm ready to escape. Somebody needs to spring me loose so I can come back and see you guys. <laughs> I think it's a common feeling, man. So, uh, audience, any questions today, please use the Q&A function down at the bottom, and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. Um, if Wes insists it's a state secret or something, we'll continue pressing him on it. So, uh, uh, Wes, <laughs> so background for Wes there is the brand home down in Louisville, which is was the first distillery you guys built after founding the brand. So, uh, you want to bring us through a little bit of uh, how this all started and kind of where you're at now. Wow. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's been kind of a blur. It really has. It's hard to believe it's been, you know, a little over 10 years um, since I started this thing and, you know, with my father and, you know, the distillery now we've had the new distillery open about four years, but uh, you know, we, we started, I started with all this idea in like 2008, 2009, and, you know, we brought it to market in uh, March of 2011. Uh, the distillery is a beautiful place. If you ever get a chance to come to Louisville, you have to see it. Uh, we're producing some fantastic bourbon there now. And, um, you know, we're just excited for the future. We got a lot of fun stuff happening. Or we're growing uh, all over the place. We, we really can't keep, uh, we can't keep up, which is, which is a okay problem to have. And, you know, we're just, we're just riding the wave, man, with everybody else. So lots of great bourbons out there. We're just, we're, we're happy to be one of them. That's cool. So was this, now you mentioned starting this with your dad, your dad obviously had a pretty legendary career in distilling and whatnot. Was this something that he kind of had fomenting around for a while or like who's, I want to know who was the first one to kind of think like, you know what we should do? We should be finishing this bourbon in a different kind of barrel. Yeah. You know, I mean, as far as the company goes and starting a bourbon brand, it was the last thing from dad's mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And it really the last thing from mine until I decided I wanted to do it. And as far as the finishing process and what we've become known for, which is a secondary barrel finish, you know, our bourbon finished in port wine barrels and our rye finished in uh, rum barrels. Um, that was really part of my challenge to dad, <coughs> excuse me, and my, my challenge that if we were going to come to this, this market or this business, we needed to have something unique and something exciting and something special. And dad was always fascinated with secondary barrel finishes. It goes back to his days at Brown Foreman and Glenn Morangi in particular. And, you know, they, they, they played around with a lot of stuff around Foreman with bourbons and finishes, but nev never did anything with it. So when I talked with that about what might be fun and might be different, we really kept coming back to secondary barrel finishes. So that's where we decided to plant our flag for better or for worse. Unfortunately, it's turned out for better. You know, in 2009, 2010, it was something that was a pretty foreign notion to a lot of people as far as bourbons go. So. Well, the say. legal, I mean, the legal environment almost didn't, there was, would have had to have been some level of fighting to be able to call it bourbon. Because at that time, right, going back to the old distiller masterpiece bottlings from Bean, if you took it out of New American Oak and put it, or put, took it out of New Wood and put it into some other sort of wood, you kind of, it was a coin toss as to whether you could even leave bourbon on the label, right? It was, and there were there was a lot of inconsistency. And there's there was for a while with the TTB on the labeling there. Now I think that you know now of course finishing I think it's finding its way into the lexicon mm -hmm. um, by itself. But you know the distiller's masterpiece was actually a, a, a straight bourbon category, and the first Woodford finish I think first or second maybe both those were not distilled spirit specialties either. Those were considered. Uh, you know, straight bourbon whiskey. So, you know, it took a while for the TTB to, you know, but, but really at the end of the day, Angel's Envy is not just a bourbon. It's a bourbon finished in port wine barrels. And that's a very important, you know, and you guys understand that distinction. Mm -hmm. And for those that are watching, you know, it's very important when we say that Angel's Envy bourbon, that we say the complete statement of what it is. It's bourbon and more is what I say. You know, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in port wine barrels. So there's a little more clar clarification now. All of us are still in the DSS category, uh, which is fine. Um, but, you know, as long as you just don't call it bourbon by itself, you're good. Well, and 
So that you're kind of missing the point. If you're going to spend all oh. the money and take all the time to finish it, you're right. not going to be calling it just bourbon, right? I mean, yeah. You, you know, I, I don't I don't understand what you mean, but um, maybe I missed the whole the whole thing, which is not unusual for me. Um, oh, it's just no calling out calling out that it's finished in port. You wouldn't want to just call it bourbon. Yeah, oh, you wouldn't yeah, go through. Yeah. You wouldn't go through buying all the barrels and then yeah. just not talk about it on I'm the sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Brett. That was that was low hanging fruit. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I made it more complicated than, than than it was. Yeah, why would you go to all that trouble if you wouldn't call it out like that? Yeah, and, you know, yeah. and certainly on the label, we might have wanted to play with how we put the things on the label, but it has to be a continuous statement. Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in port wine barrels. You know, right. the, the original for artistic purposes had Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey and there was a line underneath it. And then below that, it said finished in port wine casks, not barrels, ca or actually port casks is what it said. So the TTB made us take out the line because it needed to be a continuous statement. Huh. And they made us change casks to barrel. You know, but tomorrow you could be at a different you know, reviewer TTB and, and get something entirely different. No offense if, if, the, if the big brother's watching. Yeah, if we have bureaucrats in the audience. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> so uh, how's that been as far as getting a consistent supply of port barrels that kind of meet your quality standards with that? Do you have, do you have partnerships with different producers or did you find one larger producer that you can really lean on and make sure you have an adequate supply? We, we do. We have a broker in Portugal that's been with us since the beginning. His guy's name is Armendo, and he's in Porto. Armendo, and our, uh, our ruby port barrels are, are pretty are non-denominational. They don't come for, you know, they come from different producers. So um, he, he's given us a steady supply. It hasn't been a problem so far. You know, that we do see some, some tightness. And, you know, I mean, as, as more port, less port wine is sold or less sherry is sold or less whatever of those fortified wines are sold, it makes it more difficult to get those barrels. And we have some some backup plans there if necessary. But right now, it hasn't been a problem. So uh, on the barrel finishing, we actually got a question from Facebook here. Uh, somebody asked if uh, the finishing time counts for the age statement on a bourbon. Could you count that with a bourbon? With the new regulations that the TTB is working on, I think we're going to be there. Um, sooner rather than later, you know, they can do it with scotch. And, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping that, that, the, that the final regulations will allow us to say that, just to give us parity. So they scotch. are, because typically the way it would read now, the answer, I mean, the, the, the way it is now, the answer would be no, because you're only advancing age if you're being aged in a new charred oak vessel. Right. With size restrictions and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the language that's being worked on would be once again very similar to scotch that, that secondary barrel could be counted towards the total time in aging in, in wood <clears throat> yeah make, make it more of a level playing field when it comes to age statements i think that's fair honestly. right right and as a dss does not have you cannot put an age statement on a dss so that's the other oh, i didn't know that that's correct so uh, on the port barrels another question from facebook here is uh what kind of port ruby tawny uh, vintage even the uh, our flagship bourbon is is Ruby port uh, we released a tawny finish this mm -hmm. past uh, earlier this year which was received very well which is very uh, good yeah I, yeah I've been playing with uh, early vintage port as well as uh, some white port some other stuff which I'm talking about mm -hmm. shit I'm not supposed to talk about which here we go oh, how many minutes on. in 10 minutes <laughs> in and I'm already talking about stuff I'm not supposed to talk about <laughs> uh, so so Ruby port um is uh is, is our flagship yeah all right cool well uh i don't know if the audience has some in front of them with us but i've got a glass of that ruby port finished bourbon in front of me here at least so when you're kind of constructing this so this started obviously as uh, a brand before you had that beautiful distillery in downtown louisville built mm -hmm. right yep. so yeah. When we're drinking one of these newer batches of Angel's Envy now, are we working our way into any of that juice made at that distillery behind you there, or are we still not, a couple not years yet. away from that? Okay. Not yet. Um, we're getting there. We're, we're close. We're, I mean, we're close enough to where we, in September, we could start using that. I don't know if we're going to right away. I think we're going to let it, you know, let it uh, age a little bit longer, mature a little bit more, and then we'll start blending in over, you know, over a few years probably. 
you know, we're not going to flip the switch. Although I tell you what, the bourbon that we're making in the in, in the Louisville distillery is incredible. Um, I wouldn't be adverse to flipping the switch, but I think that that just from a consistency standpoint and you know to meet expectations of, of, of fans of the brand, we need to kind of slowly blend you know blend it over. How far how far do you feel? That's always interesting because you can have you have wonderful sourced whiskey, you make wonderful whiskey, but they might not profile the same. So what do you think the path is going to be to make a consistent transition? Well, I mean, first of all, we wanted to make sure that the new whiskey was very similar in profile to the, to the source product that, that we had. That, that, that's one step. Um, finishing, barrel finishing is a little bit of an equalizer. You know, it, 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 you, you can help with that a little bit to, to, to bring the consistency. But, you know, I, I don't know. You know, originally I planned to do it over like a four-year period. Uh, but I think more like a two year period is, is, is what we're going to end up doing. And that, some of that's going to be by necessity as well. Um, so you just really have to, you know, just really have to be careful and be patient. And, um, you know, it's a crapshoot, Brett. I mean, it really is, right. you know, I mean, fortunately it's a crapshoot. We, we, I think we have a little bit of skill, you know, uh, and kind of, we'll be able to figure it out. But the, the wonderful thing about Angels Envy is that we have a great relationship with our consumers and, and fans of the brand. And we'll have that dialogue as we're going along you know, where we'll talk about it. And, and, and that, that makes it fun. That makes it just, an, it doesn't make it something that's happening behind the curtain that we don't want anybody to see. It makes it part of the magic going forward and, 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 and involving everyone in that process. Well, I think you get a lot of fans too, because you've been, you know, more transparent than you had to be at, at times with some of this stuff, you know, whether it's been in an, an event like this or an event at the store, um, you know, when people ask questions, you guys have been forthright with your answers on it. And, uh, you know, people respect that, man. So I, I would agree. I would agree. And, you know, it, it, we've got some, some amazing, you know, friends and fans of the brand and we, we, we've built that relationship of trust over the years. And, you know, with the sourcing thing, that used to be a bad word, you know, years ago. And, Mm -hmm. I think now you can really work some magic with source whiskey. And, and the fact that we've been able to, to maintain our consistency over the years with, with, you know, three or four producers that we've had is that speaks about blending. You know, people talk about master distillers all the time. They don't talk about blending that we're able to consistently produce a product with, with three or four different producers um, over the years. And, you know, it, it is a really good uh, indication of how important the, the blending is. I had no idea you were sourcing from that many people. I mean, we know that obviously there was a long-standing family relationship with another big distiller in town. And I think people always just kind of assumed that's where a lot of juice was coming from and left it at that. Yeah, yeah they did. And, and actually um, none of it came from that particular place. I can't talk about the, the, the relationships we have outside of that, but surprisingly none of it came initially. Um, actually, I, I can't even get into all that anyway. Yeah. But, um, right. uh, but, but um, everybody thought first, first out of the box, that we had to be getting it from, from Brown Foreman, which is where dad was for, you know, for 40 years. And I can tell you that that, that was not the case. Don't ask me why, but <laughs> you know, they, they didn't take us very seriously at the beginning. Very seriously. Can I say it very serious or seriously? Which one is it guys? Very seriously. Serious. Yeah, there you go. Got to get it right. Um, which is fine. I wouldn't probably have either. You know, we were kind of like that little lap or that little dog nipping at your, at your heels, you know, in Louisville. And, you know, but, but some of the, the, some of the, the most exciting times I had early in the brand is when I heard stories coming out of our competitors where they were saying in meetings, like, what are these guys doing it? What are you doing? Why aren't we doing this? And, and then I knew that we had everybody's attention a little bit. Um, so th th those are always fun to have, you know, little moments. So the good question on that, when we're talking about the barrels too, cause you kind of have gone into source and how you can make you you can sort of correct or get the ship sort of going in the right direction through blending how when you're sourcing the port barrels are you consistently getting exactly the same size mm -hmm. because the the same size isn't used i mean the most common size is usually 500 liters which would be a pipe or a puncheon but mm -hmm. they're not 100 percent always that size so are you consistently getting one con one size we are, we're getting 60 gallon barrels every time. So that's, that's, doesn't really become an issue, you know, with surface area or anything like that, you know, having that, that, that difference, 
And we have uh, the flagship bourbon, we're finishing it in port barrels for up to six months. So when we do a blend, we'll take some that's been finished for six months. We'll take some finished five, four, three, two, you know, two seconds if we have to, um, to, to round out that blend. And um, so that, that's how you, you know, that's how you have that flexibility. And you guys know better than anybody else, not only are you dealing with the, 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 the port barrel, how many times the port barrel has been used? That's mm -hmm. another factor sure. that comes into play. So there's a lot yeah, of pieces how, to that puzzle. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. I tell people it's like so you have to assemble the same puzzle every time, but the pieces are different every time, um, which makes it uh, makes it scary and fun and all those things that you know. Yeah, and I think people don't think about that. We certainly have people that are conscientious or conscious of that have being the case in sherry. Is it from a Solera? Is it seasoned? What is it for the sherry finish? But I think the people don't think about pork in the same way. But right. you're absolutely, I mean, if you've got, yeah. and, you know, back in the day, was it, is it like, a, is it an export barrel or is it a barrel that's meant to be in the warehouse? Because they used to make export barrels, which much, with much thicker staves. And yeah, that would traveling totally barrels change. Type the, of yeah, traveling barrels totally make a difference. Yeah. And I well, didn't know I mean, that. I didn't, I didn't explain that to me, what you're saying with travel. Oh, that's a, uh, that was a thing. It was a big thing in sherry too. So way back when, when before things were bottled and then shipped away, if you were, you know, some town in England that needed a couple casks of port or sherry for the month or whatever, it would come off the ship in the cask, right? And the casks that were filled and then meant to be put on a ship and transported across the world were different than the casks that would just age in the warehouse in Jerez, Spain, or in Portugal. And they would be made from much thicker staves. Brett and I and Joe have seen some in some old Scotch warehouses in Scotland with staves that are like, what, four inches thick maybe? We've seen some at Gordon McPhail, these big old sherry butts yeah. that were filled with sherry and then shipped across the ocean to Scotland with that. And, and they, and Gordon and McPhail at least referred to them as traveling butts. And they have, and I'm talking, I mean, seriously thick staves. And right. they and it produces a different whiskey for sure. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it does. Like 75 year old whiskey we were tasting out of those. Yeah, and then you know those guys in particular have have managed to age Scotch longer than pretty much anybody else in the country, um, and they a big portion of what they credit it to besides the microclimate in their warehouse and all that are these specific traveling barrels that they have uh, with these really hyper thick staves in them. I've never had whiskey that's been in a barrel for 75 years, I don't think. Matter of fact, I know I haven't. Um, yeah, there's, uh, we, ta we tasted a couple of good ones and a couple of absolutely horrible ones. I would think <laughs> it tasted that. like licking the barrel, right? Well, yeah. that's it. I mean, I tell people, you know, what, do you, what, is, what, what is something going to taste like that's been in a barrel for 25 years? It's going to taste like a barrel. Yeah, it's going to be. Or 23 yeah. years. Tastes like the lumberyard. Yeah, 23 years is a good example yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> that exciting yeah air barrel where it still tastes like itself and that's uh you know why those bottles are 40 and fifty thousand dollars a bottle yeah that's great yeah, and baker from the chat yes that was the the this the thicker staves were used because they were more resilient and they'd hold together they yeah, could take exactly. a lot more banging around crashing around in the hull of a ship somewhere it wasn't going to break open and leak it was just it was meant for traveling you know wheel it off a dock put it on a wagon whatever take it across the countryside <laughs> it was going to hold up Sounds like Jefferson's. <laughs> Slightly different flavor profile, I'd say. So uh, we kind of covered the bourbon here. So you want to talk about your other main product that we see ideally day in and day out. We had a we had a we were out of stock a couple of weeks, but we just came back in the stores last week. Was the rye? Um, right. When did how long have you guys been bottling the rye now? I think the rye, probably about, let's see, 2000, 2020, probably six years now. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably about right, about six years. I, I should know, but I don't. Like I said, a lot of this is a blur. So and I'm glad that, that you got it back in the stores. I know we were bottling it a few weeks ago, which, is, which has been great. Our production team has managed to, we've managed to continue production uh, by keeping our people safe and so uh, the rye is fun. I, I don't really know any, any other way to describe it. It, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's almost indescribable. It, it, it's so different than any other rye on the market. And then once again, you come back to that rye finished in Caribbean rum barrels. 
Um, you know, that's the full or Caribbean rum casks in this case that let us use use uh, use casks. But you know, that rum finish is uh, that rum influence is very strong uh, in, in this in this rye. But um, mm -hmm. I enjoy doing it. My dad was not a, a believer in it when I first started working on it because it was so aggressive to him, you know, and dad was more about subtlety. I'm more about, you know, both barrels slap you upside the head kind of stuff. Uh, but, but, you know, dad did what my dad does. He just let me do my thing. And, you know, and, and if it was going to fail, it was going to fail. It was going to work. It was going to work. But I think it, I think it ended up coming together in a really nice way. I think it's come together well too. I remember, I remember very specifically the first time I tasted it. I didn't really know what to think, and it just felt like every millimeter it kind of slipped back across my tongue. It was changing its mind on whether or not it wanted to be a rye whiskey or a rum, and it was just back forth, rye rum, rye rum. But I feel like now, tasting it now, and we just cracked open a new bottle. It's it tastes a little more integrated, I'd say, than it used to. I think it's I think it's kind of it's got a little bit more direction now to use a an overbearing wine term, I suppose. No, that and I, and I like that, and, and, and but I also like the fact that it did have all those layers, and that, that it, it had that level of complexity that, mm -hmm. that you know you just didn't really know how to describe it. You know, you knew you liked it, and you knew it was unique, but you know the descriptors were just hard to come by. So, and, and I think also we've kind of dialed in this taste profile a little bit better to where I, I want it to be. Is the bottle you open from the new from the new uh, uh, the new bottling, the one you just opened? What's that batch? Does it have a batch number, Joe? Yeah, but I wouldn't know which batch. I, I don't know if that just came with the new shipment or not. <clears throat> yeah, batch 11V. Yeah, I'd have to ask Kyle. Um, I, 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 I'm really particularly excited about this last blend that we did. I think it. I think it's. Uh, uh, you you nailed it as far as you know dialing it in and finding that. You know, I, I just think it all. <clears throat> not that it ever didn't come together. I think that it's mm -hmm. we're. We're getting better at it, a little bit better at it. We're trying to figure this stuff out as we go along, man. Yeah, <laughs> this smells like gingerbread cookies. I mean, this yeah. is with molasses. I and mean, this is just like the whole office smells like gingerbread cookies. That's not a bad thing. Um, That's a great thing. <laughs> I'll I'll often leave a glass open on my desk when I'm doing tastings that are I'm tasting blends or whatever, and just leave the leave the glass just you know sitting there to enjoy it, you know. Somebody made a candle that smelled like this not too long ago. That was really good. <laughs> yeah, that would be that's definitely I say that's a uh that that's that's definitely a Christmas thing. More appealing smell than whatever's behind Brett right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that, Brett. It looks like you're swimming in a uh, in a fermenter there. I said earlier before we went live, you need to have a a a uh, a raft behind you as well. Yeah, pool right? a big pink fl uh pink flamingo pool float. Uh, we had a couple of questions. Remember. Oh, go. We had a couple of questions from Facebook, real quick. Somebody asked when you're going to be open for tours again. I think what you said later this summer, maybe. Yeah, that's the that's the plan. We still don't know yet. Uh, yeah. you know, we're working with the other distillers on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, and you know, once we feel like it, we've got a, a, a tour path and you know, everything's safe for for our team members and safe for everyone coming, then we'll we'll start doing it. So stay tuned on that. Yep. Another one was about our traveling barrels and if they'd be usable for more cycles, like a fourth or a fifth fill. I imagine, I, you know, mm -hmm. it depends on how, how long what was in there beforehand was in there and how deep it penetrated into the wood and how much then extraction you're going to be able to get out of it before it just becomes a yeah, and oxidizing. The ones, muscle, and the ones that we saw had been in use for like, they weren't pulling whiskeys out of there younger than 40 or 50 years old. Yeah. So they had already been really well used. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I but I mean, those things are, uh, you know, they're close to impossible to find at this point because it's been a long time since the industry needed barrels like that, you know? All right. So there's not a lot of those things left on the planet, unfortunately. And I don't if know you why really you like to, to somebody's point earlier, if you like port and sherry aged whiskeys, uh, do yourself a favor and drink more port and sherry because at some point we're all going to run out of these barrels. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So you have talked before about you had a very specific rum partnership that you used with this rye. And uh, then you uh, had a business partnership come up with a different rum company. Has that changed? What cast you're using with this Angels Envy Rye now? It, it hasn't now. Um, okay. I have been experimenting with other barrels in, in the Bacardi portfolio. 
Mm -hmm. to see what what we can come up with and i've been really excited about those things i mean look i would love to keep it in the family if i could but i'm also not going to mess with something that 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 is this is tasting awesome i hate to see this guy yeah Yeah, nobody's nobody's encouraged me to do that i'm doing it on my own because i think it will be fun so there are some some uh you know some 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 things that are looking really good in that respect so we'll see how it all works out that's cool now uh they've got a lot of Scotch distillers that at least the three of us are particular fans of. Have you tried anything with other, have you tried any Angel's Envy that's finished in a, in a different whiskey barrel yet, besides just different spirits or uh, different fortified wine? No, okay. but we've got a couple things that are cooking that, that, that are along those lines. That's They're cool. very early, very early. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it'd be interesting to see barrels go from <clears throat> bourbon barrels to Scotland and then Scotland back uh, yeah. to get some influence there. We've been fussing around with some stuff and we'll see how it turns out. Um, but I think it's a great idea. I really do. That's cool. We're going to have Stephanie McLeod from Doers on uh, late in July, actually. I think July 22nd or something. Um, and I know they're doing a lot more with their kind of barrel finishing, even with they their are. basic blended brand. So some we're going to be talking about with her for sure. I think they really upped the game at Doers um, with mm-hmm. these. Are you talking about the 375 formats? Are you all getting those? They did those too. Yeah, those were great. We'll talk about those when she's on. Those were awesome. Yeah. They're, you know, and Doers is, you know, I mean, they're, they're transitioning. I mean, they've got wonderful whiskey and they're, they're now – taking advantage of these opportunities to do things like that and, and do more premiumization, which from a brand perspective, I love it. And we've talked with them about a lot of different projects and a lot of different things. And, you know, it's, it, that's the great thing about being part of a big family, you know, being part of the Bacardi family is that we have all these potential opportunities and, and viewpoints and partners and stuff that are just right under the same roof. Um, and if it makes sense, we'll take a look at doing stuff, you know? Yeah, that's cool. I love the single malts, by the way. I love the I love the uh, Bacardi single malts um, line. They're they're, they're great. Really Craig Ellicke is one of our favorites, and yeah. Aberfeldy as well. We were at a couple of those distilleries about a year ago now. Yeah, um, that's in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? Oh yeah, kind of. You get every, yeah, everything in Scotland is really in the middle extent. of nowhere. Yeah, yeah Aberfeldy's. I think there's six thousand people in Aberfeldy or something like that. <laughs> yeah, the trip yeah. to worth it though, because you can go to the Highlander and get that haggis. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you get a good piece of haggis nearby. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm not looking for right there. <laughs> oh, I've got a dive both feet, Wes. It's delicious. I, I'm just scared. I, I gotta admit, you know, I'm. I, well, so to, do, do you build to, in? Do you build in by going to Cincinnati and getting Geta? Yeah, have you ever had Geta in Cincinnati? It's like no. a it's a second rate American version of haggis that. Joe and Brett are going to make apologies for the quality of it, but it's really, it's like if, if it's like if somebody decided to make haggis out of ground beef and then barely use any spices, it's garbage. It's that just sounds garbage really Cincinnati wrong. food. You know, no offense to anybody who might be tuning in from Cincinnati, but you screwed up chili and now you screwed up this weird spiced meat thing too. Oh man, that's a direct shot. The skyline chili thing. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. Have you, I mean, if you've had, if you've had skyline chili, I don't know. You know, I think I've met two people ever who actually like it. You know, people that love it swear by it, though. But, yeah, I think that they kind of done some very wrong things with that. But you know, when I went to China, I, I, I swore and actually did it. I would eat pretty much anything that was put in front of me. And I did. I didn't ask what it was. Oh, that's the key. And, yeah, right. Uh, you know, until – and then now I, I know that while I was there, I also visited these open-air markets and stuff like that. Now I realize how bad of a decision that might have been. Um, <laughs> I thought they were really cool back then. But um, – not so much now, right? <laughs> right? Well, unfortunately, it's gonna be difficult because that's how a lot of that's how a lot of people in those countries get their food. Yeah. Well, it's about as fresh as you can get. Yeah. I don't know. I take I take fresh over processed most on it most most other days. I don't know about in certain places though. Yeah. Amen to that. So, so uh, go ahead. Go, well, we were going to, so we made it the, the obligatory half an hour before we ask. Um, you know, in the past, we were, we, we, on, I believe, St. Patrick's Day, about seven or eight years ago, we had the good fortune of tasting with you in the South Loop Tasting Room and uh, uh, get, digging through some experiments. 
uh, and doing some blending with some samples that you had, which culminated in a couple of Vinny single barrel, single barrel, single barrel batches. Uh, St. Patrick and St. Joseph, I believe we called them. Those were fun. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> we were able to do that for a few years. That's kind of fallen out. What is the status of a customized program possibly being developed again for some of your favorite retailers? We're getting close. We really are. I think COVID might have knocked us back a couple steps from a uh, like a CapEx perspective and getting the things together we needed to make the program work. But we are we reimagine the program and we're introducing other variables into it as opposed to just blends like different finishing terms and different maybe finishes that are outside of the outside of the regular line things that you'll really be able to customize what you're yeah. doing I, I love the way we did it before i thought it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. but I, it, it was a lot of work too for us and i think one of the things and i don't know how you guys feel about this i think one of the problems with that program was was that i don't know if there was enough differentiation on the shelf between the the, the like the benny's blend and the, and the core angels envy so i think there was some confusion there um, so we're, we're reimagining it in a way that makes it more distinctive, that allows you guys to have more variables and, and, and different, lots of different ways to do stuff. So I'm really excited about that. You know, I'd like to see that start maybe rolling out next year. Uh, I don't know how we're going to be affected because we did have to invest in some, some blending tanks and stuff like that. And with the, with the, you know, with the COVID kind of throwing things off the tracks, I don't know how, how that's going to materialize, but you know, we're working our way back. We love, we love working on those things with you guys. I think you all are the leader. Uh, leaders in the country on, on, on those types of projects. And uh, I'm excited to, to get them going again. Yeah. Cause that did, cause we, you know, it was, it was tough to distinguish unless you turned it. Luckily our people were really excited about it. Right. We were able to kind of, you know, we did like to have a story goes back to what you said about quality where you can have, there's going to be some variation that for consistency purposes, you can blend out. But in this case, it was an opportunity to talk about all the different good tools that you had at your disposal. And we just sort of were able to expose a couple of the different tools, mm -hmm. you know, and put them side by side with the idea for us was to put them side by side with what's going to be there tomorrow and a year from now and two years from now and so on and so forth. And that was fun. You know, I mean, that was fun. I think that the, the viewers today, obviously, they know Benny's and they know you know, the, the, those of you may be new, you know, that the, 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 there's such an appreciation for what you guys bring to Chicago, you know, that you just don't see a lot of other places, that level of sophistication, but it's not sophistication to the point to where it's, you know, hey, I know more than you know, you know, it's sophistication in so much that, that you're always searching for new things. You're always, and, and not just searching for new things, you're educating people when they walk in the door as to what makes those things unique. And, and that's the education component. I mean, any, any, any store can do a special blend or a special barrel or whatever and throw it on the shelf and, and charge more for it and say, here you go. But when you're doing what you're talking about doing and, and educating and, and highlighting the differences and making it an experience and education as you go along, that's, that's really what makes it special. Yeah. Well, people don't like it, then we're out of business, so. Right, <laughs> we well, thanks, need... Rick. I guess the pressure's on yeah. now, right? Yeah. So uh, speaking of pressure on to innovate, you guys always have, I assume we're going to see it again, the annual cast strength release in the fall. Um, and we've seen, uh, thankfully, we got some of the tawny port finish. I know there was a sherry barrel before that really just kind of hung around the distillery, right? Um, can we expect to see another kind of limited, higher priced Angels Envy release, do you think, in the coming six months or so? No, no, probably not. <laughs> um, you know, we did, we did two in a couple of years and that, that was not really planned that way. It just kind of fell in. Okay. You know, I never really want to get on that gerbil wheel of innovation to where I have to just keep spitting stuff out. You know, we've got a yeah, bunch You don't want to have to stick to the schedule of just having to have some new no, package. No, I don't, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't roll that way. And I think that, that, you know, if it's special and it's something to talk about and adds the conversation, then that's when we're going to come out, you know, and we've got probably 20 some odd different innovations and, in you know, in different stages of development right now. And we'll just start leaking those out as, as they, as they happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we are coming up on our 10th anniversary. So who knows, you know, it might be fun to do something special there, but you know, we, we, we just don't know. 
right. that, 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 that's a great non-answer, isn't it? I mean, that, no, it's that, a, I mean, it sounds like a pretty well rehearsed non-answer to me. But uh, you know. well, it keeps you from having to stick to a schedule, so you can continue to sure. do what you want to do, and you don't have to stick to a schedule. I'm all about that. I, a lot. I've been using the word "ish" a lot with stuff. You know, I don't <laughs> know if "ish" is a word or not, but I've found that if you put "ish" behind anything, that it it absolves you of any responsibility to be accurate <laughs> about that statement. Yeah, it'll well, be uh, uh, the other oh, question okay. I have for the future, I guess, is uh, the new distillery and how's that coming along? What are you talking about? What are you talking about, Will? It was all over the news. This isn't a secret. Oh, okay. All right. I don't watch the news. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't, we don't really have a new distillery right now. We're working on, we have warehouses. We bought 300 some odd acres out in the countryside. Beautiful okay. countryside, by the way, farmland out in Henry County, Kentucky. So we, we've just we, we've just opened a, a brand new barrel warehouse. We've, we've got three more we're working on and plans are to, to would be to potentially put another distillery out on that property, but we're still a few okay. years away from, away from that. And then we'll probably maybe open that up for experiences, you know, maybe uh, deep dive brand experiences and, you know, fun stuff like that. You know, there's a big fishing pond out there and, you know, be crazy not to do something fun out there like that, right? Yeah, if you got a good piece of property, you want to use it, right? It's we got another question from Facebook here, and that is, have you ever released any whiskey without any finishes? No, we haven't. And, we, you know, as a brand, we've gone back and forth about, about that. I think as of now, where we've landed is, if it's in an Angel's Envy bottle, it'll be finished. You know, Angel's okay. Envy has become known for secondary barrel finishes. That's not to say we can't do releases outside of Angel's Envy from the distillery that, that might be unfinished. You know, unfinished bourbon is phenomenal. So I think it'd be, uh, I think it'd be crazy not to consider it. Um, and then we've thought about it. Yeah, I guess a uh, Facebook user next time, when we can start hosting in-person events again in the stores, you ought to check out an Angel's Envy event because uh, Wes has been known to bring some unfinished goods with him at times. I have brought some unfinished goods, and it's fun to it's fun to see that. And uh, it's fun to taste it side by side. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's for see sure. where they go. <laughs> All right, cool. That's it. Those are the hardball questions you got for me. You waited a half an hour, and that's that's that's. <laughs> you didn't hit me well, too that bad. was it. We just you normally. When's the last time we've talked that we waited a half an hour before we started badgering you about casks? <laughs> you, yeah, nor usually, normally usually it's the opening sentence. I I am very impressed with the level of restraint. Um, uh, <laughs> But uh, no, I, it's because I, of all the carbon dioxide fumes that are coming up behind me right now in this uh, active fermenter. You know, the, the funny <laughs> thing about carbon dioxide fumes and fermenters is, is and I do it all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> I like to stick my head down in, in near the fermenter and smell it and, 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 and understanding that you can't get too close because for those of you that have never stuck your head near a fermenter before, is you've got all that carbon dioxide off gassing. And if you stick your head too far down there, you literally, it'll knock your ass out. And I, I don't know why it's like, there's a, there's a, there's a couple steps in the distillery that have been there since the distillery's open. And I trip on them every time I go through there, <laughs> I trip going down them and I trip coming back over them. So I, I don't think I'm a complete idiot. Um, and I'm not, old and infirm yet but those are two things i seem to have issues with around the distillery um i'm, I'm trying to co2 get... and tripping on the same step over and over again <laughs> <laughs> i just wonder if there's a connection there um I... I'll, have to, I'll have to pursue that a little bit further <laughs> yeah the co2 probably leads to tripping on the steps at least on the way out <laughs> yeah i think so too i really do i think i think i might have got a question by text here let's see uh, I think I understand you now giving up. Oh, here we go. This is funny. Though. Um, I think I understand you now giving the CO2 conversation. Oh, that's great. I appreciate it. So that explains a lot of things about me, apparently, that people were, you know, people were wondering about. Now I have an excuse for pretty much everything stupid I do from this point forward. It's, hey. the, CO <laughs> it's the CO2, baby. Well, you know, people, seriously, I mean, you know, I mean, you guys know that I'm in, I'm in the fire service and, you know, um, that can kill you. I mean, it, it can. You get in a room full of carbon, a room full of carbon dioxide. Um, sure. It, it can kill you. I mean, it, it's a very dangerous. We've seen it in the fire service a number of times where, and like in restaurants and stuff like that, where, you know, you've got closed carbon dioxide tanks with, uh, with uh, Coke machine, you know, with, with Coke, you know, with refreshment machines or whatever. And mm -hmm. people, people have died from that. Fortunately, I haven't gone that far yet. And I haven't fallen in yet. So, 
So. Yeah, you got a problem if you fall in. That's yeah. not really not yeah. even path to get out if you fall in. No, there's not, and I'm claustrophobic, so I don't think that will be a pleasant experience for me on a number of levels. <laughs> um, so we'll just take that off the table. <laughs> So well, when, you, uh, when am I coming, well, man? When are we, we will shoot for maybe uh, November, December, if we can start talking about something? Do you think, think we'll be ready then? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that's not really in our control, you know? Right. So we're just kind of playing it by ear. Our stores are open. Um, Illinois expands hours uh, coming up soon. We're going to, after the 4th of July, we're going to expand our store hours a bit. Um, so we've got, uh, we still have a couple new stores in planning here. We've got a, uh, we're moving one of our stores out uh, out by my neck of the woods from St. Charles over to Geneva. That store is going to have a education room in it. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to do some, you know, in-person live events at our new store in Geneva. So Fun. Um, where's, yeah, where's stay posted Geneva? on the Vinny's site, hopefully. So. What part of town is that? Where is that? That's uh, far western suburbs, kind of. About west. as far west as goes, you know, on the edge of the cornfields. But uh, ah. good area out there. It's a, it's a busy area, so... <laughs> Um, nice. hopefully, hopefully when we can have in-person events again, you know, we'll get you doing right. your little tour, you know, get me out, man. I'm a prisoner here. <laughs> Help me, please. So, well, that's well we might come down and visit us, you depending. We might come down and visit you before, uh, we get a chance to get anybody up here. Cause at some point in time, we are going to be down for some barrel picks. And so yeah. we'll be in Louisville possibly by the end of July. Yeah. Holler. I mean, I'll, um, I'm going to be in Florida for a little bit of that time, but um, we'd love to have you guys and you're welcome anytime. I'd love to see you all. Yeah. We're not getting on an airplane though, which the downside to means we're going to have to ride in a car with Brett Pontani driving. So it oh, provides no. a whole nother set of challenges. I've heard stories, um, but <laughs> you know, really flying now, and I've had to fly a few times. I think flying safer than going to the grocery store now, you know, right. The, you know, everybody's separated on the planes. There's nobody in the airports. Um, I feel more angst, like I said, going to the grocery store than I do to get on an airplane. But yeah, they've already got an excellent. I mean, they have excellent filtration systems anyway for the air, right? So, yep. and that's going through as long as everybody keeps a mask on and nobody goes crazy. You go ahead, right. man. I'll drive. I'll drive that's down. Down. Oh, that's a short now. It's like no, I'll, I'll take the three hour. Was it yeah. four or five yeah. hours? Drive. Uh, four and a half hours. It's an easy drive. Yeah. Three hours and 50 minutes if you don't hit traffic and you don't stop. Got it. And you don't obey. And you speed. go fair and you don't pay much attention to the speed limit. Yeah, there that's, you go. That's the way I roll. <laughs> well, uh, Wes, thanks for joining us today, man. Always good to talk yeah. Angels Envy and finished whiskeys with you. Um, if anybody has any other questions, let us know, really. Um, and you can always send any questions you have about products we carry to spirits at binnies.com. That goes to Brett, Joe, and I. And if we can't answer your question, we'll uh, get it to somebody who can uh, in theory. So we'll be back next Wednesday. We've got, uh, who do we have next Wednesday? We have Fawn Weaver from Uncle Nearest and uh, their director of whiskey operations, Sherry Moron, another ex-Brown Foreman person, I think, um, coming on next Wednesday with us. So everybody have a good, safe 4th of July. Wes, thanks again, man, for joining thanks, us. Man. Always a pleasure to talk to you. My Thank pleasure. You. And last thing, uh, go to my, uh, follow me on at KY Bourbon Maker, at KY Bourbon Maker, if you get a chance. to love to love to chat with folks so uh and once again guys thank you for everything you do thanks for what you do for the industry and um look forward to seeing you soon all right thanks everybody so, cheers. Take care. Right, cheers thanks right, thank you cheers take care guys